Right. Hello. It's one o'clock. Um, hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacy McKenna and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Cliff Smith, Director of the Washington Project, and Sam Westrop, Director of Islamist Watch, join us to discuss Jamaat e Islami, a threat to Americans. Mr. Smith and Mr. Westrop will speak for roughly five to 10 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to get to all questions, but we have many participants on this webinar, so I apologize in advance if we do not get to yours today. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Cliff Smith and Mr. Sam Westrop. Hello. Um, in previous webinars, and in fact, in articles and reports that Islamist Watch has published over the last few years, we have tried to make one thing very clear. And that is that Islam and Islamism in the West is not a single homogenous block. It is very diverse with many competing components, which sometimes spend more time fighting each other than, than the outside world. Uh, and within the world of, of non-violent or, or lawful Islamism, groups active in the West that are advancing their ideology through generally lawful means, there is that same diversity. That is that there is that same array of, of differing views and ideas. Now, one of the problems with counter-Islamism analysis in, in not just this country, but around the Western world, has been an obsession with a group called the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood exists and is dangerous. Um, but because of that obsession, other groups have flourished uh, under the lack of spotlight. And no group has flourished quite so well and so successfully as Jamaat-e Islami, um, a South Asian Islamist organization uh, founded in the 1940s and very active here in the US. There are, as I mentioned, many different groups to focus and worry about, but Jamaat is perhaps one of the most egregious, one of the most dangerous, because it mixes terror elements with a powerful ability to affect change here in the West using Western politics, Western courts, Western media. Uh, it is a multifaceted organization uh, that has proven itself able to advance its sinister ideology, advance its iniquitous ideas uh, in many different fields. Uh, and until about a few a year or two ago, very few in America had heard of the group. Uh, very few were concentrating on its effects and the damage it uh, is able to cause. Uh, Cliff, I think, will explain a little bit more about its, its history. Cliff. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, Sam, thanks for that introduction. Um, Jamaat-e Islami was founded in British India. So that's India while well, it was still under British rule before it was partitioned into Pakistan, before Bangladesh existed. And it was founded by a man named Abdullah al Madudi. Um, Madudi was very similar in many ways to the, ideolo the ideologues, um, the radical ideologues of the Middle East, such as Hassan al Banna and the Muslim Brotherhood. But in many ways, he was actually uh, more innovative and more effective than they were, particularly in his time. Um, he admittedly, by his own, in his own words, believed Islam was a non-conventional religion and instead was a quote-unquote revolutionary ideology that called for an international revolutionary party, so, which he then went about establishing, that being Jamaat-e Islami. Um, he had many starts and stops. He had, he had a lot of hiccups and a lot of, um, but a lot of success too, including not only in British India, at the time, uh, which was not too long after he founded it, partitioned into India and Pakistan, but um, also across the world, really. Um, famously, he corresponded quite a bit with Syed Qutb. Syed Qutb, as anybody that follows um, modern events for the past 20 years uh, knows, was one of the chief theologians responsible for inspiring Osama bin Laden. But um, while Syed Qutb has gotten so much of the um, publicity and the fame, the truth of the matter is um, Madudi was probably more influential than Kotib than Kotib was on, um, on him. So when we talk about the success of Abdul al-Madudi, um, you have to realize just how um, universal his writings and thoughts and organizational structures were on radical Islam. It wasn't just in South Asia. Anyhow, he was not, um, he didn't have a particularly strong opinion on the partition of India uh, as he viewed basically, you know, the entire system is corrupt. But once Pakistan and India separated, he became a very, very big on wanting to control Pakistan and make it into a 
Islamist government, which he had worked from the very beginning to do. Um, all, and then, of course, as he gained influence in Pakistan, that became very, very a big deal, a, a seismic impact on how they handled their politics, including to the creation of Bangladesh, which is a very big event in Jamaat-e Islami's history. Sam can talk a little bit more about that. So 1971, Bangladeshis were fighting for their independence from Pakistan. And the Pakistani military, in an effort to suppress the, the academics, the intellectuals, the students, the protesters, turned to Jamati Islami to help them uh, and help them violently. Jamati Islami was part of, of many different killing squads which went around the country, murdering uh, in huge number, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, uh, Bangladeshi women, men, children. Um, some of the leaders of these killing squads were pretty prominent Jamaat Islami students. And after the war ended and the new found Bangladesh was established, um, these Jamaat Islami leaders fled. Um, many, some, many fled to Pakistan, some fled to the West. Um, and when they fled to the West, they did not give up their Islamism, they did not give up their ideology. Uh, they set up new branches. So in the United Kingdom, a man called Chowdhury Muinuddin, who was part of the Al Badr killing squad, uh, um, he set up a group called Muslim Aid, today one of the largest Islamic charities, uh, still today tied closely to Jamaat Islami. He set up a number of community groups too. And here in the US, uh, Ashraf Zaman Khan, uh, another Al Badr killing squad leader, uh, became closely involved in the Islamic circle of North America. The most important representation of Jamaat Islami in America and identified by some as one of the key branches of Jamaat Islami in the world today. Uh, now, Jamaat in America, especially Jamaat Islami Pakistan and Jamaat Islami India uh, uh, branches are yes, best represented, most keenly represented through ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America. And ICNA is a hub for all sorts of Jamaat activities. It's not just one group. For a start, it has local chapters all across the country, but it also runs several charities. It has ICNA Relief, its domestic aid charity. It has Helping Hand for Relief and Development. It's international, it's foreign aid, it's humanitarian aid charity. It has Young Muslims, a youth group uh, that indoctrinates young Muslims through study circles and various religious activities. It has uh, Gain Peace and Why Islam, groups that aim to proselytize and, uh, uh, bring more people into, not into the Islamic fold, but into the Islamist fold, into the Jamaat Islami fold. Um, ICNA is an all-encompassing organization that seeks to provide social and religious services across the US to as many different Muslim communities and non-Muslims as well. And as part of that, um, they receive government funds. The ICNA relief has received $10 million from the federal government uh, between 2016 and 2018. And, and note those dates, that's under a Trump administration. Um, uh, Helping Hand for Relief and Development has been praised on various government websites. Um, uh, and you know, across the country, ICNA officials will find themselves praised by local councillors, uh, by local politicians. The city of New York gave ICNA a, a grant to host religious services, which you would have thought would be a challenge to separation of church and state uh, uh, several years ago. So that there's the ICNA has intertwined itself with local politics, um, with international aid programs, with domestic aid programs. As I say, this is a, a powerful, a powerful force. Now, as part of its work within the Muslim community, it runs one of the largest conferences that the Muslim community has each year, uh, and does that in collaboration with a group called the Muslim American Society, which is more traditionally linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it runs these conferences, which tens of thousands attend. Uh, very prominent politicians speak. I believe Bernie Sanders was slated to speak at uh, 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 one such conference, um, although that ended up not going ahead. Um, the uh, power they have to uh, uh, organize themselves to the face of American Muslims is huge. And politicians recognize that as such and attend their conferences. Um, but it's not just about uh, the 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 you know, radicalizing America's Muslim community. They're also funding uh, Jamaat Islami efforts abroad. So as I mentioned, Helping Hand for Relief and Development is ICNA's overseas arm. And the money it raises is spent, uh, enormous amount of it, uh, a large proportion of it is spent in Pakistan. And a couple of years ago, we caught Helping Hand for Relief and Development working with two front organizations for Lashkar Taiba, the Pakistani terrorist organization responsible for the 2008 Mumbai attacks. 
we caught them working together. They ran a conference together in a, in a Pakistani city. This was an open collaboration. It was a shameless collaboration. And we suspect it's just the tip of the iceberg. And certainly we can see that Helping Hand partners closely with very key Jamaati Islami proxies across Pakistan, including groups tied to terror, like the Al Kidmat Foundation, the, the charitable arm of Jamaati Islami, which openly funds Hamas, which openly is tied to Hizbul Hamajadeen, the uh, paramilitary wing of Jamaati Islami. So um, the American uh, Jamaati Islami movement, while it's tied very carefully into lawful activities here in the US, it's also still funding unlawful, violent activities overseas. And, and just two examples I'll very quickly mention. I'm speaking to you today from Boston, uh, and about uh, 20 miles from me is a group called the Islamic Center of New England, a very prominent mosque. And for many years, Helping Hand for Relief and Development has run events there. Uh, ICNA has run events there. It is a, an important mosque for Jamaat activities in New England. The Imam in the 2000s was a man called uh, Hafiz Muhammad Masood. And he, it turned out, is the brother of Hafiz Muhammad Saeed, the leader of Lashkar Taiba. And when this was pointed out in the 2000s, Muhammad Masood says, oh, yes, he is my brother, but I share nothing in common with him. I have no, no links to his, his terrorism. I, I, I repudiate, I reject his ideology. And every, everyone believed him. The media believed him, local politicians believed him. Then in around 2008, he was deported. It turned out he lied on his visa application. He was deported back to Pakistan. What did he do the day he got back? He became the official spokesperson for Lashkar Taiba. Um, so I think this sums up this, 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 the, the problem of, of Jamaat able to transform itself in the West, on the one hand being a supposedly lawful, uh, generous organization, and on the other hand being indelibly tied to terror and extremism. Um, that's not the only example of domestic uh, Jamaat terror links, though. Uh, in Connecticut, something very interesting happened last year. Cliff. Uh, yeah, um, just last year, a man named Farid Khan, who seemed to be just a simple mechanic working in Connecticut, was um, arrested and then later convicted of lying to the FBI as part of a counterterrorism investigation um, from a counterterrorism task force um, effort. This, um, he had a brother that court documents indicate was a Lashkari Teba supporter, um, and over $200,000 went through his bank account. And one of the things he was, um, he, the things he was um, convicted of lying about was that he claimed he only sent clothes to his brother in Pakistan. Um, all indications were he really was part of a money laundering operation. Um, he also was a chief ICNA HHRD fundraiser in the area. In fact, he was spoken to by um, FBI agents when he um, was busy raising funds for Islamic Circle of North America. Um, so this is just another example. Again, we don't know how much far that goes. We only know what's been put out publicly by the Justice Department and what's in court documents. Um, but this is just another example of their ideological extremism, at minimum, um, having a lot of terrorist connections, if not uh, you know, um, overtly being involved in these kinds of things. Um, the Middle East Forum has been working for some time to bring attention to this issue with a fair amount of success. Um, last year, um, Congressman Jim Banks introduced HRES 160, which calls out Jamaati Islami's actions across the board in India and in Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, and also their fundraising arms and their links to terrorism in the US. Um, Congressman Banks and a number of others, including Congressman Fleischman, Congressman Weber, a few others, sent a letter to um, the uh, counterterrorism coordinator, Nathan Sales, um, bringing attention to some of these. Um, actions by various ICNA officials and um, that appear to be terror links calling for a, a more thorough investigation. This got a lot of coverage in the Indian media. I've uh, got several wire stories written by a US um, Indian correspondent that really brought a lot of attention to this issue. Um, that led to something very interesting. We learned not long after that a umbrella group called Interaction, which has roughly 200 um, charities underneath it. It's an umbrella organization, many of which are totally innocuous, but they have a sub umbrella of five charities, which are very closely linked to terrorism. In some countries, some of these members of the sub umbrella called the Together Project are designated as terror financers. The explicit goal of the, of the Together Project is to basically deflect um, 
any accusations of terror finance, to deflect any ties to terrorism, to basically normalize these groups as much as possible. We discovered not only were the, was this Interactions Together project meeting with congressmen discouraging any kind of investigation, but it even hired Perkins Coie, the large international law firm responsible for the famous Steele dossier on President Trump, to essentially try to discredit some of these very public and uh, very easy public open source um, um, facts that we had uncovered um, and to try to basically obfuscate and deflect attention. Um, so that shows how deep their influence goes. Sam. I wish we had more time to explain the full extent of Jamaat activities here in the US. I certainly recommend you read the many articles we've published on the subject at meforum.org. Um, but I just want to end with this. Uh, Jamaat is a dangerous force. It has flown under the radar for decades. Um, across the US, it is radicalizing uh, the next generation of Muslim kids. Uh, we need your help to oppose it. So write to your congressman. Uh, tell them that it, the federal government cannot be funding one arm of the ICNA network while the other arm of the ICNA network openly partners with designated terrorist organizations in South Asia. So write to your representatives, see if ICNA and all other Jamaat groups are active in your town, in your city, speak to local journalists, uh, work to halt, to diminish, to challenge the influence of Jamaat-e Islami. Um, you just have to look to Europe to see what happens when you don't stop that radicalization in time. Uh, if we don't, further kids running off to join terrorist groups, more terror finance, uh, a more extreme Muslim community and fewer chances for moderate Muslims to gain back control from the grip of Islamists. Thank you. All right, thank you both so much for that. Uh, with Jamaat expanding in South Asia steadily for more than a decade, what can the United States do to counter that expansion? And is Jamaat the Islami already having cells within the United States? Well, I think oh. as, as the, the discussion about ICNA shows, yes, Jamaat Islami has cells all over the United States. States. I mentioned it, there are others. The, the Muslim Umar of North America, for example, is the best representation of Jamaat Islami's Bangladeshi's uh, branch. As it comes to the United States, look, India has already designated or banned Jamaat Islami from operating in some parts of, of the country. Uh, other countries, including Bangladesh, have, have spoken out about the dangers. The United States should be taking on board what these two South Asian countries are saying. They should be making sure that any US charity that works with a designated terrorist organization is investigated. And that so far doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, Cliff? Yeah, and th that's really the thing. I mean, th this is not secret. This is very open. Um, Islamic Circle of North America and um, MUNA, all these other groups, HHRD, they don't really hide their um, Jamaati affiliation. I mean, th any kind of separation. I mean, I'm not saying there's one guy in Pakistan controlling them, but they clearly share ideology. They have links openly. They talk about them on their website. This is not some kind of, you know, conspiracy theory. This is, you can go look on their website and see what they say about themselves. They're not hidden about what they think and who they admire. Um, this is clearly what is going on. The more interesting question is, you know, why do people um, not recognize them for what they are and for the danger they are? And that, I think, is in large part because as Sam mentioned, you know, we've had this obsession with the Muslim Brotherhood, which the Muslim Brotherhood are not good guys, and that's not beyond, dis that's beyond dispute, but there's been this monomaniacal focus on them as the you know, purveyor of all radical ideologies related to Islam, and it's just not true. If anything, I would say that Jamaati Islami's franchise groups, its friends in the U.S. have been more influential, have gotten more funds, have gotten more respectability, and have been more involved in shaping policy than Muslim Brotherhood linked groups have been, and certainly of forming the minds of certain radical uh, Muslims. Thank you. What can be done to drive a wedge into the red and green alliance to pull away the leftist allying with Islamism in the United States and Europe? That's a very interesting question. I, if, yes, the questioner is right. For decades, uh, by the Red-Green Alliance, what he means is the, the link between Islamists and members of, of the far left, and, and even the, the, the moderate left uh, in America. Um, it is very puzzling indeed that there are some on the left in this country who would work with Islamists who openly advocate for the killing of homosexuals, for the imposition of barbaric theocratic laws that would, that would wipe out the, the, the smallest vestige of liberalism 
uh, if it were ever in power. It is mad that this alliance exists, it, but it does exist, it always has. Um, it's not just with Sunni Islamism as well. Just look to see uh, the Iranian links with far left groups. Uh, you know, the, the point is that they may not agree with the other's ideology, but they see utility in working together. Uh, I think this can be stopped by appealing to the center left. There are sensible people out there who you know, have certain political views of economically, socially, but they do not identify with the dogmas of the far left. And I believe, and I've experienced that they are horrified when they find out that some of their partners, they're regarded as, as good faith minority partners, are actually people who are advocating the most fascistic of ideas, the most intolerant and violent of ideas. It comes down to a question of education. So explain the dangers of Islamism, explain what Islamists believe, show them what Islamist clerics are saying and what Islamist charities are doing. Uh, facts are our friends here. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to educate the left just as much as we need to educate the right. I would also add that I think that the left is um, obsessed with the idea of the oppressed and the oppressor. And the Islamists are often very good at painting themselves as oppressed. When you actually see a lot of what Jamaati Islami groups have done, do is show that you know, the South Asian Muslims are oppressed in different ways. That's what they claim all the time. And to the point you can, but in, in truth, um, in most places in the world, the Islamists are the oppressor, and to the degree they are being oppressed is often because they are trying to commit acts of terrorism, create theocracies, things like that. So to the degree you can show, look, no, they are not the oppressed, they are the oppressor, they are posing as the oppressed in order to be able to oppress more. That is something I think that over time, if that takes um, the, um, hold in the ideas of the left, that will be a valuable contribution to breaking up this alliance. Thank you. Um, so which one would you say is more dangerous to the West and America, Jamaat al-Islami or the Muslim Brotherhood? I would suggest Jamaat al-Islami. And I, I say, if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago, I would have said the Muslim Brotherhood, most likely. The point about the Muslim Brotherhood, this is a slightly different topic, but the Muslim Brotherhood today, very briefly, does not exist in the form it once did. Uh, 20 years ago. There is, it is, there is no evidence that organizations founded by the Muslim Brotherhood in America, groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Muslim American Society, there's no evidence they're still taking directions from some sort of centralized Muslim Brotherhood hierarchy in, in, in Egypt or Qatar or Turkey or wherever. The Muslim Brotherhood is split and uh, dissipate, uh, dissipated. It is no longer a cohesive force. Jamaat very much is. It's an organized force. The, the, the different branches liaise with each other very closely. There's a clearer ideological uh, uh, agenda. There's a clearer organizational structure. Um, Jamaat is dangerous because it's organized. The Muslim Brotherhood remains dangerous because its ideology is so pervasive, but it doesn't have the power to organize mass change uh, in the way that Jamaat potentially does if it continues to exert an ever greater influence over American Muslims. Thank you. So we have time for, well, we don't have any time, but we have two more questions that I'd like to uh, ask. Uh, how are Islamist war criminals accepted into the UK and US, and why do you think the governments were blind to these groups? I would say that I think that, it is, I mean, especially when um, Bangladesh was partitioned, um, I mean, there was a lot of confusion about the in the West of what happened, who was responsible, what was going on. It was, it was uh, something the West had not focused on. It was something we were not, you know, deeply knowledgeable about. Um, and I think that also the ver various problems in Bangladeshi government, the Bangladeshi government has problems of its own, has led to this. And in the case of Bangladesh, we don't actually recognize, you know, their war crimes tribunals. Like, so in other words, if Bangladesh convicts someone of a war crime, the U.S. doesn't automatically accept that as being true. It basically has to go through its own processes. Um, I think it is important that the government does go through its own processes and um, you know, investigates these guys and comes to what I believe is, in most cases, um, the right conclusion by the Bangladeshi government, um, for example. Um, and there's indications that that's happening. Um, there's even stories recently about the, um, the U.S., um, the various law enforcement and intelligence agencies um, asking for information on um, Bangladeshis. There was even a story about that, what, two days ago, of someone that was convicted of war crimes. But that's something that should go, keep going on. But it's very sad that they have lasted for this long here um, and that we haven't gotten a handle on it. Again, I think it partially goes to 
um, radical Islamists, in particular Jamaat franchise groups that are trying to whitewash these individuals and protect them. I think that's a big part of it too. Thank you. So last question, as American citizens, and I guess around the world, we have quite a few viewers elsewhere, uh, what can we do to pressure our governments or media to, do, to more openly expose the connections between Islamic charities and terror activities without coming across as Islamophobic? Mm. I think w one of the... And the website where we can buy One of the huge problems we have um, when it comes to Islamist charities in the West is the lack of information about how they operate in areas of the world where terrorism exerts an influence. Uh, so, for example, uh, in the Gaza Strip, um, many Western charities fund local partners, uh, have local charities they work with. They're not required to publish lists of those local partners, so it's difficult to see if they're working with front groups for terrorism. The same is true in Kashmir. Uh, the same is true in Yemen and uh, across the Middle East and other parts of, of, of South Asia particularly. Um, legislation, improved legislation can help with this, with this, this question, forcing charities to open their books, uh, uh, especially if they receive government funds, so that the public can hold them accountable and find out who they're working with. Uh, I think that would be particularly important, and that's something that, that the Middle East Forum is looking into uh, at the moment. Uh, information clarity, that's, that's what's key. Persuade your government to stop funding any group that has ever worked with a proxy organization for a terrorist group, unless there's evidence it was an absolute accident and it has since reformed. There are too many Islamist charities in the West who have funded terror in the past and simply uh, gotten away with it, uh, either because there isn't the willingness to prosecute or because perhaps they were working with this group before it was designated, but now it is designated. There needs to be much better government uh, uh, scrutiny of these charities and their activities. And you can encourage that, and the media can encourage that. So don't just speak to your legislators, speak to journalists, present them with the evidence that we could collect and that you can collect, and let's hold go government accountable to make sure that we're not subsidizing Islam's terror in the name of humanitarian aid. Let me add to that just a little bit. Um, I, it is clear to me, although you can never know their inside of their thinking, um, that the amount of exposure that um, Jamaati Islami and their franchise groups in the West have gotten in the past year or so due to some of our research and the research of some of our friends um, has really rattled them because they've never gotten this kind of coverage before. In addition to um, the research we've done, for example, I mentioned um, that when um, Congressman Banks wrote that letter, um, there were several wire stories written um, that got puffed up across the world um, that really brought this issue to light. Just in the past few weeks, um, um, R.T. Singh, an uh, Indian reporter, has reported a number of things about what these are groups up to in the U.S. Um, it, and it's, we've gotten some U.S. coverage of it, too. Obviously, the South Asian community has a particular interest in this. And so my point is, they've never gotten scrutiny like they have gotten in the past couple of years. And the, j journalists paying attention to these kinds of things really makes a big difference over time because it influences governments um, a lot when you get a lot of coverage of these kinds of things. All right, thank you both so much for taking the time out of your day to speak with us. Uh, we have come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, there will be a short survey to fill out at the end to better help us serve you going forward. Also, if you're looking for more information, please visit our website, www.meforum.org. Uh, we will have Robert Spencer join us this Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern to speak on, is Islam globally waxing or waning? Thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a great day.